From the Toronto Star, I'm Rudger Mudler, and this matters. When it comes to the vaccines, won't someone think of the children? The truth is, a lot of people have, but at this point, they're at the back of the line for a number of reasons. At its simplest, COVID-19 doesn't affect them as badly and doesn't typically lead to the worst of outcomes. That said, there will be a time when kids will also need to get their shots in the arm, although there still needs to be more research done. Right now, only one of the four approved vaccines in Canada are known to be safe for teenagers 16 and older. But it was also recently announced that the Moderna vaccine has started clinical trials with children from the US and Canada, with kids starting as young as six months old all the way on up to adolescents and younger teenagers. To discuss what else needs to happen and when we might be taking our kids for their shots, we are joined by Dr. Karina Topp, an associate professor in pediatrics at Dalhousie, an infectious disease physician, and also a vaccine researcher at the Canadian Centre for Vaccinology. She is here to talk about kids and vaccines. Dr. Topp, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Why aren't children a priority for the vaccine right now? Right. So I know that's a question that's been on a lot of people's minds in terms of vaccines are, you know, historically mostly for kids. And this is really the opposite setting with the COVID vaccine program. So what we do know is that age and older age is the biggest predictor of severe COVID and the factor that's most strongly associated with the risk of ending up in hospital, risk of dying from COVID is age primarily. And fortunately for children, they have been very mildly affected by COVID and many have you know, fewer no symptoms if they do get infected with the virus. So the focus right now, especially with limited supply, has been on getting it out to those highest risk groups to prevent as much severe disease as possible. And then we're working our way down through the adult population and we'll eventually get to kids. You're a pediatrician. Are you surprised by COVID and its effects on children and the fact that they haven't been particularly large spreaders, even schools have for the most part been kind of safe. Just looking at this sort of virus, is it surprising how it affects children? Yeah, it's certainly been really interesting as a pediatrician to kind of see what's happened with this virus in children compared to other respiratory viruses that we're very familiar with, like influenza and respiratory syncytial virus or RSV, which is something that is very common for us to treat young infants because it can cause severe pneumonia and lung infections in small babies. So what we do see with the flu, for example, is that very young children tend to be at higher risk than older children or teenagers or, or younger adults of having complications from the flu, developing pneumonia, for example. And children also are really important in the transmission and spread of flu to other people and especially to vulnerable people like their grandparents. And COVID is very different. And we're not really sure why exactly. There's a number of different hypotheses out there in terms of, you know, the differences in where the receptor that the virus binds to is located in children or the levels of it present in children versus adults or their experience with other types of coronaviruses that can, you know, that are the seasonal coronaviruses that cause colds, that sort of thing. So, but we really don't understand why that's the case, but... You know, we're really pleased that it is at least a mild disease in children. I'll take anything good with this that I can. So we'll go with that. For everything I've read, and, you know, I'm the father of a nine-year-old girl, so obviously these things are top of mind. Listen, I also have elderly parents, so getting them vaccinated is part of my thing right now as well. But from everything I've read, eventually we will reach a point when we will want our children vaccinated. I want to talk to a little bit about that, but let's also be very clear. I believe there are four vaccines that have been approved in Canada. As far as I can tell, the Pfizer is the only one that I believe is approved for children 16 and up. What is going on with the rest of them? Are they in clinical trials? Can you tell us what that process is right now? And then can we move on to when children might actually need to be vaccinated? 
Right. Just to answer the second question first, I would say like ideally everyone would be getting vaccinated right now, but there's a number of reasons why that's not possible at the moment for everybody. So in terms of where we are around the data that we have around how safe and effective these vaccines are, it's just sort of a matter of how the trials were set up. So the Pfizer, BioNTech, COVID vaccine, they set up their trials to include adolescents, teenagers, 16 years and up to adults over 80. And that was sort of the main phase three trial, the main large clinical trial that was the basis for the approval in Canada. They also actually have included children 12 to 15, and they have some early data on that on the teenagers as well. Currently, they've finished enrolling a trial of that 12 to 15 year age group and are you know, following them up and collecting data and analyzing it. So we hope to have results from that trial by the summer. For the other vaccines, so those include the Moderna COVID vaccine, mRNA product, the Oxford AstraZeneca viral vector vaccine, and the Janssen viral vector vaccine made by Johnson Johnson. They're initial phase three trials only included people 18 years of age and over. And so it's just simply the way the trial was designed that Health Canada didn't have enough data at the time they reviewed it to license it for younger age groups or approve it for younger age groups. And so Moderna has also now finished enrolling teenagers in a trial of 12 to 17 year olds. And they, I think, again, similar to Pfizer, expecting data or results by the summer. Janssen and Oxford AstraZeneca also are planning trials in children, at least teenagers and younger children in some cases. And I know Pfizer and Moderna are planning trials in younger children as well. The actual, the sort of lower age group is variable and the details of those trials aren't yet fully available. But I think, you know, some are looking at children as young as five, some might be looking at children as young as two, but those are in the planning stages. So I think results in young children may not come until, you know, towards the fall. We'll be right back. One of the things I also read is is that finding children for clinical trials can be a bit more difficult as opposed to older adults who obviously want a vaccine as soon as, well, everybody wants a vaccine as soon as possible. But is that one of the issues? Yeah. So, you know, normally it takes about 10 years to get a vaccine from, you know, animal studies out into the public. And with these vaccines, we've been looking at between 10 months, you know, 14 months to get them out to the public. But that meant you know, all the resources were put in to speed up those trials as much as possible. But as would be with any other vaccine, they started with adults first and healthy adults and then focused on the older age groups, people over 65, because that was the high risk group. And then it's easier to go into teenagers down from adults because their immune systems, their immune responses to vaccines are more similar to adults. But younger children, their immune responses are a bit different. And so there may be more adaptations that need to be made. And some they may have to, you know, try different doses of the actual, you know, substance in the vaccine or different dosing schedules to get the same responses as adults. So that may take a bit more time. Certainly recruiting, you know, for pediatric trials is more challenging. There's more ethical concerns because, of course, children can't consent for themselves. But, you know, here at our center, actually, we do lots of vaccine trials in children. And so there's certainly ways to work around it. It just takes a bit more time. And then these trials, because the you know rate of disease is less in kids and also to try to get information sooner, they're not enrolling as many people, but they are going to be needing to look at comparing the immune responses, how the immune system is responding to the vaccine in those younger children compared to adults or teenagers, rather than looking at the rate of COVID disease between, you know, the kids who get the vaccine and the kids who get the placebo or a comparator vaccine. So those trials are just a bit more challenging to do. And I think, you know, if people think that it's getting harder to enroll in trials in general, because people are looking at, they may be able to get the vaccine for sure versus being potentially randomized to a vaccine versus a placebo now, or, you know, you could wait and hopefully get the actual vaccine, you know, when it's available to you. So I think there's a number of factors, but the idea of even having COVID vaccines available for kids a year and a half after the pandemic's declared is still a you know, remarkable timeline. I think that that's something. How remarkable that timeline is and what should parents be keeping in mind at this point? Well, I think it's frustrating for everybody. And I know the people in my life too, 
you know, the vaccines are available and we haven't been in a situation in this country in a very, very long time of having to ration vaccines and prioritize who gets it. And so I think people who are tired of the pandemic, they want it to be over. They see the vaccine as a solution to that and they want their vaccine as soon as possible. And I really wish that we had the doses and the capacity to give it to everybody, you know, faster than we do. But this is a situation we're in. So I think even once as people are trying to get vaccinated, there's lots of other ways to keep safe. And those other public health measures are going to have to be with us for some time until everybody Everybody's vaccinated. I think one challenge, sorry, is going to be that, you know, once parents get vaccinated and their teenagers might be, you know, struggling with, are they going to be under more restrictions than their parents? You know, what toll will that take on them? And I think we'll have to have good communication with families and parents as all the public health restrictions evolve and change over the next few months. I'm going to skip ahead to a very practical question. Hopefully, my parents will be vaccinated sometime soon. They're not 80 yet. What exactly will be the rules if my child is not vaccinated and hanging out with them? Is it still basically mass protocols for a while? Or, you know, what kind of advice would you give to people about something like that? Yeah, so we're still learning more about how well these vaccines actually prevent people from getting asymptomatic infections. So just getting infected with the virus, but not showing any symptoms and how well they prevent transmission of the virus to another person. So there's early studies coming out in particular from Israel, which is a country that, you know, has had a really massive vaccine program. They've vaccinated most of their adult population already, and they are promising. That's the Pfizer-BioNTech product that they've been using exclusively. And so it does look like it's effective against transmission. And so public health will be reviewing that data as it becomes available. And as more studies come out, there'll be data coming out of the UK and I'm sure the US very soon. And, you know, once we have a better sense of how well these vaccines actually prevent transmission, prevent that asymptomatic spread, and we have more real world effectiveness data, then we can start to look at how soon or what are the criteria to actually start to loosen those restrictions and, you know, allow people to gather without masks or distancing, for example. So it's hard to know at this point. I think certainly once grandparents are fully vaccinated, had both their doses, and that's certainly a safer time to get together. But I'd still say at this point, you'd want to still be keeping your social circle small, washing your hands, wearing masks, obviously not getting together if anyone's sick, those sorts of things. I think one of the other interesting questions is, particularly when we're talking about vaccinating children, everything with this has happened so quickly. Are people going to require booster shots like over their lifetime for this, for this vaccine? Do we know that yet? How long, I guess, is a vaccine going to last? Are we aware of that yet? Or basically, is it one of these things we're going to see as time goes by? Yeah. So, I mean, so far, again, we can start to see the very early results from those first phase three clinical trials and looking out now, we might have six months of data, I think. But obviously, it's going to take time to know, you know, how many people will be protected over a year or two years. But we already know that, you know, there's these COVID variants that have come up. So UK, in the UK, South Africa, Brazil, and now there's a few out of the US as well. And so what's more likely, I think, at least in the shorter term, is that we may need, you know, a booster dose of a slightly modified vaccine or a vaccine that covers against some of these other variants or a couple different strains of the virus. And so the companies are already developing, you know, modifying their vaccines to be better suited, to be more effective against those new variants. So, you know, I think people are starting sort of the infectious disease and epidemiology community starting to think that, you know, COVID may become like a seasonal virus that we deal with. And so we may need to get, you know, boosters. It's hard to know every one to five years to adapt to the changing forms of it and to maintain our immunity. But time will tell. I'm sure this is one of these things that, you know, I feel like I've gotten a medical degree just reading all this stuff. You have three. (laughs) What research out there are you paying attention to right now? Is there anything that's really caught your eye or piqued your curiosity that you find interesting or you're just watching right now? Well, there's certainly a lot coming out, and so it's hard to keep up with everything. But I think what I'm really excited to see is the real world data that's starting to come out. You know, and I try to look for, because I'm a research scientist, um, try to look for the original papers and review all the data. There's certainly a lot of news releases coming out as well, but I try to dig into the data. You know, there have been at least three studies released from the UK in the last couple of weeks with their early experience with both AstraZeneca and Pfizer vaccine, and that shows 
strong effectiveness of both vaccines against hospitalization and death. And then, as I mentioned, the studies out of Israel, which is kind of like a natural experiment. It's like one vaccine product in the entire country. And so they really can look at how effective that particular vaccine is. And then there's data coming out of the U.S. as well, which is now administered over 100 million doses of COVID vaccines. Yeah, so those are public health data sources, academic papers that I'm really excited to see. There's also going to be a phase three trial of the Oxford AstraZeneca product from the U.S. that's coming out later this month. That will also be interesting to see those results. And I think they may have more adults over 65 as well. Well, Dr. Tava, this has been really, really fantastic for us. I like to usually end off with a pretty open-ended question. I mean, we're talking about vaccines and children. Is there anything that I didn't ask that you think that our listeners should know or keep in mind? Well, I think, you know, it's great that there's so much enthusiasm and demand for the COVID vaccine. So I really want to stress that all of the vaccines that have been approved in Canada are safe and effective and very effective against you know, severe disease and would really strongly encourage everyone when your turn comes up to go out and get your vaccine. And I really do hope that vaccines will be more available for teenagers and younger children soon. I think well, the point I might have forgotten to mention is that the National Advisory Committee of Immunization here in Canada actually is now recommending adolescents who are 12 to 15 and have certain high-risk medical conditions can get the Pfizer vaccine. So that's starting now how, whether provinces have the supply to give it out and how they approach that for that age group is not clear. But I think, you know, parents who have children in that age group who have high-risk medical conditions can at least be reassured that their kids should be prioritized over the next several months. Well, basically, the kids are going to have to wait, but one day they too will be getting a good shot in the arm. Dr. Top, I really, really appreciate your time today and your expertise. Oh, thanks very much for having me. Dr. Karina Top is an associate professor in pediatrics at Dalhousie, an infectious disease physician, and also a vaccine researcher at the Canadian Centre for Vaccinology. That's it for today. Thanks so much for joining us. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Raji Budder, Adrian Chung, and Saba Etisaz. Produced and mixed by Sean Pattenden, and our director of programming is J.P. Fozo. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon.